morning. Good morning. Welcome to day two first talks. Um, we have Luca Lampariello now. Um, and again, remember for the questions, you go on Slido, enter the keyword bubble, and then you can already now ask your questions. You can vote on them, and at the end, we will go through them. And it's much faster and much more effective. And now the scene belongs to Luca. Okay. Good morning to you all. I hope you can hear me well. And um, I'm very glad to be here and to the thank you, big thanks to the organizers of the Polyga Gathering for giving me this chance of talking here. And thank you for coming here. So, Without further ado, let's get started. This is a talk about um, overcoming the intermediate plateau. So I'm gonna lay out some strategies and some principles on how to move past the so-called intermediate plateau where people tend to get stuck and to reach fluency in any language. So let me switch now the microphone with this. Let's see. So the first question um, to address is, what is this intermediate plateau, right? because it's important to define the problem. And the intermediate plateau is that phase or stage or area of language learning where you tend to put in F, the same effort that you put before, but you get stuck. It seems like things are not moving and it's very frustrating uh, for a learner. And that is kind of inevitable, unfortunately, because of the way our brain is and works. So, the other key question is, why do we hit the intermediate plateau? Why does this happen, right? And it's something called the law of diminishing returns. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but basically, the law of diminishing returns means that we reach a level where we put in the effort, but unfortunately, we get very little return because of that. So, for example, this is what an average language learner expects you know, the things to happen, like I got, as time goes by, I'm gonna reach fluency. But this is actually what really happens. So you, you know, with time you put in the effort and then things unfortunately stall. And I wanna stress the fact that I'm talking about the average language learner, meaning that the average language learner unfortunately does not know and does not expect this to happen. And when this happens, they are the loss. They say, well, why? why? Is this something wrong with me, right? Um, so I want to approach this, the entire problem of overcoming the intermediate plateau from three different points of view, three different angles. And the first one, we're going to see it from a psychological point of view, because I believe in education, we're very focused on strategies, on techniques, on the nitty gritty details and the technical stuff, but actually the psychological factor is one of the most important things in language learning and is often neglected in, within the education, uh, educational system. So the first thing that we're going to see is prepare your mind. The second one is more about the technicalities, like learning how to learn, which I believe is extremely important in the 21st century as a skill. And the third one is uh, we're going to tackle the problem of overcoming the intermediate plateau from an organizational point of view. So how to organize your language learning. So the first part is about preparing your mind. And the goal of this is to develop an unbreakable language learning mindset. I, I've been learning languages for 30 years, and I've been coaching hundreds of people. And I believe that this is the biggest problem. Some people, they are not sure that they can actually learn a language. That's the biggest problem. I remember when I was starting to ride a bike, which is a skill, it's a motor skill. I was super frustrated. I started at the beginning and I, I just couldn't ride a bike. But then I, you know, it happened and I figured out I can do it. And there's a big difference between those who have learned a language to fluency and those who have not learned a language to fluency. Those who have never learned a language to fluency are not sure that they can actually do it. And this is a very important point to develop a language learning unbreakable mindset. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of this. It's called the motivation dip. And this reflects what I was saying before, meaning that it, it, there comes a point where your skills stall and then your motivation goes down. Because you start at the beginning of learning a language and then everything goes well. I'm learning new words, I'm learning new grammar things, and then all of a sudden things stall. And that's the moment where 
your motivation goes down. And this happens to a lot of people. I would say, I would dare say to most people, that's why they tell themselves, they throw their hands up and they go like, no, this is not for me. Language learning is not for me. I'm not good enough. So this is a direct reflection of the law of diminishing returns. So the first important thing to take into account is the fact that you have to be aware, first of the motivation dip, then of the law of diminishing returns. And this, the other important thing, which I believe is essential, is to build an emotional connection, build or rebuild an emotional connection with your target language. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to show you a little exercise that I do. I think it's very powerful. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about connect emotionally with your target language. Einstein, who's my biggest hero, I have posters all over my place of Einstein, it says, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited and imagination encircles the world. I remind you that Einstein was not particularly good at mathematics, but he was particularly good at what is called thought experiments. He could imagine something even before he had to apply physics or mathematics to it. And I believe that imagination is the most beautiful and most powerful weapon we have to project ourselves into the future and to create the future we want. So what does Einstein and imagination have to do with language learning? For, is there any French, are there any French people here? So you might also, non-French people might know that La Boom is a cult movie in the 80s. And um, I remember when I was, I was 13, I had been struggling with French at school. And then I found out that I could watch French TV with French subtitles. And my French was okay. I was not doing very well at school. But then after I saw Sophie Marceau, my French lit up. My motivation literally <laughs> exploded. <laughs> so, and, I rem and I remember in particular this movie when I was, I, I think I was four, thir between 13 and 14 when I had started watching all these French movies. And I started imagining in the back of my mind every single time, every single time I sit down and I wanted to learn French. I thought about, I projected myself into the future, and I was thinking of actually using the language with Sophie Marceau in Paris, Montmartre, romantic environment, talking about why I had learned French, why I wanted to live in France. You know, sometimes we tend to learn languages because, you know, some people think it's cool to learn Chinese, it's cool to learn Spanish, it's cool to learn Georgian. But until that moment, I did not exactly know why I was learning French. You know, I was at school, and French was just another subject. Nobody had told me, you have to learn French, or French is great because of this, 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 and that. But when I started watching, not only Sophie Marceau, but when I want, started enjoying the French culture through television, and I realized, this is a language I could be using in the future. This is a language that could make a difference in my life. And it did, actually, because then I moved to France. I lived in, in France, and I got to know a girl who was very similar to Sophie Marceau, so sometimes, Dreams come true. But I believe that dreams come true because, also because it's not just random. Sometimes we can imagine things to happen, and sometimes things do happen kind of in a way we want them to happen. So for me, this was really important. Imagining myself always in the back of my mind why I'm learning a language is so important. I remember once, I, I've been learning Hungarian for around six years or something like that, and I still remember my uncle. He was just asking, you know, when you, you meet your parents you haven't seen in a while, hey, what are you doing? I'm, I'm learning Hungarian. And he looked at me and said, why, why would you learn Hungarian? Why? Like, why? He said, well, do you have to go through this ordeal? And, <laughs> and the thing is that he, he could not imagine that. But for me, learning Hungarian was important. There's 10 million Hungarians. So, and I, I knew that once, you know, once I learned Hungar Hungarian, I would have gone to the country. Now I'm going to Budapest in a little bit. I was in Budapest for so many times, and learning and speaking Hungarian has made a lot of difference. I always, every single time I learn any language, I always have in the back of my mind, subconsciously, the desire and the, a clear vision of why I'm learning a language. This makes a whole difference, because language learning is a long road. It takes four, five, ten years to speak a language well. If you forget why you're learning a language, then at a certain point when life gets in the way or you know, stumble upon some obstacles, then you let go and you say, why? Why do I have to learn this language? So 
An exercise that I do, I, I used to do, I, now it's, it's become automatic, so it's in the back of my mind, but I asked uh, some students to do this, and they find them very uh, powerful, is to take some 20 minutes in silence, you take a piece of paper, you take a pencil, and you think and project yourself into the future, thinking how you're going to be using a language in a meaningful way, within meaningful circumstances, things that talk to you, right? Things that make you <laughs> vibrate, things you connect with. And in the description, when it comes to describing or writing down a little story of yourself using the language, living the language, breathing the language, you can think about it, make it emotional, make it detailed, make it strong, make it vivid, make it concrete, and make it realistic. And what I mean by realistic is that things that you think are actually going to happen. It's not just something in a vacuum. Now, this is the kind of thing that I have in the back of my mind when I'm learning Greek, but you can just tweak it to any other language. So I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it from here. September 2023. 20, I'm in Paros a small island in the Mediterranean Sea. It is 11 a.m. While standing on the beach, I can feel a light breeze on my face. I spend the next hours alternating between swimming in the water and relaxing on the sand, reading a book written all in Greek. At lunchtime, I go to a restaurant that serves traditional Greek food and eat there with friends, Greek and foreign alike. We chat in Greek and English. My friends are surprised I can speak so well, but I assure them that I'm not that good yet. We laugh together, and I suddenly feel as learning this language has caused the whole of Greece to open itself to me. So this is for me is emotional, because you, you, it's not just a description of something, it's just an emotional connection, it's something that is realistic for me. It happened before in the past, so I'm using the past and connected with the future, because I've been to Greece a number of times. Although, the truth be told, when I was in Greece, I still did not speak Greek, but I know what it would be, what it, what it, it might change to speak Greek in Greece. And I um, asked my students not only to write on paper, because I believe that paper is still much stronger than just filtering th things through a screen, but also to make it just very evident. You know, you can see here that this is a student who's learning, an Argentinian student who's learning, who was learning German at the time, and he wrote the story, projecting himself to the future, and he put a flag on it. I, I'm particularly drawn by, you know, colorful stuff, so adding a flag is, is very uh, motivating for me and, and for him as well. So it's not just taking the time, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, to think about how you're going to be using the language, but it's not just a one-time one exercise. It's something that you should have there in front of you all the time. So. It's important to be aware of the law of diminishing returns and the fact that you're going to experience a motivation dip, then it's important to connect with the language. But that's not enough. You know, you can be emotionally connected with the language, but then you have to actually learn the language. And at the intermediate level, this is particularly tricky. Because at the beginner level, you know, you just grab a course for beginners and you just learn. You don't know much about the language, so it's easy to start. The problem comes when you hit the so-called intermediate phase where you're um, good enough to be able to read simple dialogues, but you're not good enough yet to enjoy authentic content. So it's this kind of gray zone that is really frustrating. You tell yourself, why can't I do this stuff yet? So we're gonna, I, I do believe that methods are important, but methods derive from principles. So instead of showing you some you know, specific methods, I'm gonna talk about the principles that guide these methods and that make a difference. There's a lot of principles, but I'm going to, you know, for lack of time, we're just going to talk about the, the three most important ones. And the first one is consume compelling, comprehensible, and rich content. The second one is engage in purposeful practice. And the third one is stay within the Goldilocks zone. So let's take a look at each and every one. The first one is consume compelling, comprehensible, and rich content. What do I mean by that? Does any of you know Stephen Krashen? So, for those who don't know, Stephen Krashen is a very famous linguist that talks about uh, you know, the importance of input, to put it simply in simple words. And he says, and I quote, we acquire language from input. 
We learn from understanding what we read and what we hear, not from speaking and writing. Our ability to speak and write fluidly and accurately is the result of acquiring language from input. When I read these words, I was not so sure about them because I said, okay, input, but are you not supposed to speak in order to, you know, if you want to speak well, you have to speak. But actually, the, the more, you know, the more I think about it, the more it makes sense. An example of that is the fact that I was convinced that in order to improve my Hungarian, always back to Hungarian, I had to speak. So I had two tutors, and I spoke with them twice a week. So once with one tutor and once with another tutor. And I thought, well, the more I speak, the better I'm going to get at speaking, or the better I'm going to get at the language. Actually, my, my speaking skills and my listening skills just stalled, and my reading skills as well, because I was spending all my time speaking and not much time listening or reading or listening and reading or watching. And this is about acquisition. There's a, there's a difference between acquisition and learning that I hadn't grasped uh, until then. And there's a big difference. So now it's more like I understand that acquiring a language is the base and learning a language, actively, consciously learning a language is something that you put on top of that. It's not the first thing, it's the second thing. So exposing yourself to the language is important, but in, especially at, at this stage, exposing yourself to content that is both compelling, comprehensible, and rich is particularly important. What do I mean by that? Compelling is something that is interesting, right? So it seems obvious to you guys. You're all polyglots. You know what it is to get grab stuff that is compelling. But for the average uh, learner, probably who are listening or will listen through the internet, the problem is that they, we were all used to studying, you know, using stuff we didn't like at school. They gave us stuff we couldn't care less about. So it's really important to design your own language learning, to take initiative, to, take, to, to, to make sure that you always come up with content you like and that you create the content. The second thing is that the content has to be comprehensible. And what I mean by comprehensible is that, for example, if someone comes to me and this happened, like learning Spanish, and they go like, hey, Luca, uh, I've been learning Spanish for three weeks. I I've been listening to the radio the whole day, but I don't understand anything. I said, well, you know, I said one, one, one step at a time, right? But it's surprising because for us, it's okay, you have to understand in order to make progress, right? But a lot of people just listen to the radio thinking, I'm just going to listen to the radio the whole day and then magically I'm going to be speaking the language. This does not work in the real world. So the content has to be comprehensible. And here's the trick, and this is an important part. The content has to be comprehensible, but it has to be rich as well. What do I mean by rich? Rich means that a content that you consume, if you want to move forward, if you want to make progress, has to be content that contains language that you do not know. So it can be 10%, it can be 20%, it can be 30%, but it has to contain vocabulary and structures that you do not know. And if you want to you know, combine these three, you want to make sure that you use the tools that the internet provides in order to make the incomprehensible comprehensible. Have you ever heard of Google Lens, for example? Google Lens is an app that you can use with, with a telephone. It's, it's free, and you just can scan a text and make it immediately comprehensible. So if you have, I don't know, learning Chinese, for example, you can just scan a text, and this Google Lens transforms this text from Chinese into your native language, and it even reads it in both languages. So, and I repeat, this is a very important point. If you consume content that is compelling and comprehensible, but it's not rich, you're not going to advance much. So this is specifically a talk about the intermediate stage, right? You have to make sure that the content is also rich, contains information that you do not know and you can learn from in order to advance. Let's see if this works. So. This is the kind of language learning strategy that I have redefined with time. At the base, you can see there, it's input, 70% or 80% of the time. Then you have output, can be 10% or it can be 20%. The Hungarian lessons that I have is on top of, of the input strategy. So I spend most, the bulk of my time listening, reading, listening and or reading and watching stuff. On top of that, I also have output activities, one hour a week or two hours a week, and on top of that, I have grammar studies or like grammar drills. That's at the end of it, not at the beginning. So it's something like 70%, 20%, 10%. And this is how we actually learn languages at school. We have 
at, at, on top, at, at the beginning, at the base, we have study, you know, grammar, or grammar rules all the time. Then you have output, depending on the country. In Italy, it's not even output. We don't even speak the language. I don't know about now, but... And just on top of that, we have some input there. Oh, let's do some input sometime, you know? When the, when the time comes. No wonder why people do not learn languages. There's this infuriating thing that people, a lot of people who don't know anything about language learning, they go through years of school, they don't learn a language, and they think, it's me. I'm not the one who can learn a language, but it's not them, it's the system that does not work. That's why I'm so passionate about not only language learning, about education, because it's important once you understand what this implies, if the entire education system changed just this kind of strategy, things would, would turn for the better, I think. So I made it a, um, a rule, a fundamental rule, that is, I'm reaping huge benefits from this, which I did not do before, is that I make sure that no matter what, I spend at least 30 minutes listening to the spoken language of my, my target language every single day. It can be listening and reading, or it can be just listening. For example, listening to stuff I have previously understood, avoiding the radio ordeal, you know, because if you just listen to stuff you cannot understand, you're just, I, I'm pretty sure this happened to you guys. You listen to something that you just partially understand, you lose focus, you think about something else, because you lose interest if you can't understand it. So that, this is really a simple rule, but it makes a huge difference to listen to your target language every day, no matter what, and then you do something else. You can do grammar drills, you can talk, but this is important. It's not even difficult to do these days. You just get the material, you shape it, you know, you create your own material, and then you just spend 30 minutes listening to your target language. Let me just check how much time I have because we have 45 minutes here and it's already 22, okay. So, with that principle number one out of the way, let's talk about engaging purposeful practice. Have you ever heard of this term, purposeful practice? Simple practice, deliberate practice. So, simple practice and purposeful practice is the, the mode, in the, it's called the, a learning mode. It's the way you learn a language. Mind you, this is not what you do, this is how you do it. It makes a huge difference. Let me give you an example of that. So, Let's take the four areas, right? Listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Let's start with simple practice. In reading, simple practice is equivalent more or less to extensive reading. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard of this. Extensive reading is just reading for pleasure, right? You're reading a book for pleasure, for the pleasure of it. So you're sprawled on the couch, or lay laying in bed, and you're just reading for the, the fun and the sake of it. While Purposeful practice requires more um, concentration, more focus, and it's about, for example, analyzing a script, listening to the script, uh, marking every word, and you can see the difference between intensive and extensive reading. In intensive reading, you read, for example, one page and it takes you 15 minutes to go through that page because you're listening to it, you're reading, you're marking words. In extensive reading, what you're doing is just you're reading for the pleasure of it, but this is only possible when your level is high, right? Otherwise, you cannot do that. And the same thing for listening. Again, the radio stuff. So if you have developed, if you have a high level, you can listen to the radio and maybe you can understand 60, 70, 80, 90% of it. But if you don't have a, a good level yet, then you have to resort to purposeful practice, which is listening and reading at the same time. Because if you don't read what you're listening, you can't understand it if your listening comprehension is low. Speaking. If you are like with your friends, like we're going to do tonight, we're talking, just chit-chatting with people, that's simple practice. You're just using the language as it comes. But purposeful practice, you're using the language with a purpose. For example, with um, a tutor of yours, and you know that you have maybe a specific topic in mind, and you're speaking so that you can get out of your comfort zone, and you make mistakes, you get feedback, and you learn out of it. It's completely different. It's a completely different level. And the same for writing. You can write just a journal for the sake of it, or you can write an essay, or you can write a short text, and you can get feedback. And again, both of these are very important if you want to make progress. Now, for the sake of simplicity, because language learning is actually more complex than this, imagine that learning a language is like climbing a hill, the first part from zero, like from scratch, to B2, which is on, the, on top, 
you know, B2 fluency, we call it fluency, depending on your definition of fluency. And then the other stretch from the top to the end of the, the infinite end of the valley is like native like, um, you know, ability, fluency, competence. And um, at the beginning, if you're learning, for example, a language that is really distant from yours, let's say an Italian learning Georgian or Russian, at the beginning, you have to engage in purposeful practice because imagine an Italian learning Russian just listening to the radio or reading a book, Dostoevsky, something easy, right? <laughs> it's going to be very difficult. So you have to start with assimil or you have to start with teach yourself or you have to start with something that has di simple dialogues where you can actually you know, decode the language little by little. That's 100% purposeful practice. If a language is really similar, you can kind of tweak this like Italian Spanish. But let's, for the sake of simplicity, let's, let's consider this as a standard procedure, standard path. Then 100% zero at the very beginning, 90%, 10%, so 90% purposeful practice, 10% simple practice, and then the thing flips once you reach a, a, a B2 level. If you want to keep improving, but this also goes for, you know, from B1 to B2, you have to do both. You have to engage in deliberate practice and simple practice. If you just engage in simple practice, meaning, for example, that you have a B1 level and you just talk to people, you know, you just practice a language, you just write something, you just read something, but you don't do any concrete purposeful, you, don't, you do not engage in any purposeful activity, your language learning skills are going to stall. And this is exactly what happened with my Hungarian and other languages as well. So if you want to continue improving, then you want to engage in purposeful practice. Most people who reach B2, they never go beyond because, because of the law of diminishing returns. You have to put more effort in order to move from B2 to C1. So the bottom line of that was that it's important to consider both modes. Okay? It's not just simple practice. We can't hope to just use the language and then we're going to get to eloquence. And mind you, this is important if you want to get eloquent in a language, if you want to get it really good, if you want to be able to express yourself well. If you just want to speak fluently, that's a different matter. These are two different layers, or two different le levels, uh, competence levels. Now, principle number three, which I really like and I think it's really important, it's called stay within the Goldilocks zone. And this is a really important one. Language learning has to be rewarding. If it's not rewarding, you're, in you're not going to do it, you know? The secret, if you want to call it a secret, the secret of polyglots is that they love it. They love learning languages, you know? But this is not the case for a lot of people who have to learn languages for whatever reason. They have to move to in, in country. They have to, you know, uh, learn languages out of necessity more than out of desire uh, or out of passion. The Goldilocks zone in astronomy, actually the Goldilocks is a, like a little story, you know? Uh, but it turned into a content, was transferred for example, in the, in the field of astronomy, it's a small range of orbits around a star that are ideal for liquid water to exist. Um, it, it's also called, in, in, there's other technical terms for this, but the concept is that the Goldilocks zone is attached to the Goldilocks rule. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of James Clear. He's a very famous habit guru that talks about habits. He wrote Atomic Habits, among other things. And he says, humans experience peak motivation when working on tasks that are right on the edge of their current abilities. Not too hard, not too easy, just right. So if you're doing something that is too easy, for example, let's, let's suppose that we, are, we have a, an intermediate level, lower intermediate level. And someone, after six months of learning whatever, French, Russian, they give us back the Asimil book or the teacher's self. We're going to look at it. What, what's that? I, I don't want to engage with Asimil. It's too easy, right? But at the same time, as I said at the beginning, they're not able to read Dostoevsky yet. So they're frustrated. Dostoevsky or whatever. So something that is in the middle, just right, could be, for an intermediate learner, could be, uh, for example, a podcast with a transcript. Again, that has the features that I told you before. It's rich. It's interesting. It's, it, it has new information and it's engaging, and it's comprehensible. So the, the bottom line is that to reach fluency, language learning has to become a habit. There's no other way around it. I'm going to show you now how I turned this into a habit. <clears throat> and 
you have to make sure that you, the resources that you're using are challenging enough, motivating to use, and helpful for making daily progress. And then that resource or those resources are within the so-called Goldilocks zone, and you can continue learning for months, days, months, and years on end. So with those two things, those two parts out of the way, let's talk about organizing your learning activities. This is a very important one, especially for non-expert polyglots like you guys. Um, so it's important to develop a powerful and sustainable language learning routine. Without that, you're not going nowhere. It's like, you know, people talk about methods. You have a Ferrari, but if you have no fuel, you're not going anywhere. So there's, again here, there's a lot of important rules. We're going to talk about these three, which are particularly important. The first one is design your environment. The second one is make it easy to start. And the third one is keep track of your learning. So. Design your environment has three main features. It's about time, place, and reminders. So let me give an example of that. This is how my beloved Greek learn language learning routine looks like. I always have a glass of water. I have my language learning material. You can see it here from, you can see the, you know, this is a script of easy Greek. I don't know if anybody's learning Greek, but then I have a, a book about linguistics and I have my, my notebook. And I always have it there. So I have it there, it's all ready. And then I have the, the, the globe, which is really important motivating. Why am I learning language? Because I want to travel the world, I want to breathe language, I want to talk to people, I want to connect with the world. So it's important that before anything, you have your resources ready and waiting and nothing else. You just want to clean the, uh, the desktop. And now, this seems obvious, but my desktop has been a mess. It's always been a mess. I have all sorts of things. And once I started clearing the mess, things got better. Because you just see Greek. You have no other distraction. Remember, every single object on that desktop subconsciously makes you think, make, distracts you, makes you think about stuff connected with that. The second one is make sure your learning space is clean and distraction-free. This is also another rule that I had. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I guess you know, also use the phone to learn, phone or computer. I have removed every single distraction, notifications from my phone, notifications from my computer. A lot of people still, uh, to this day, have them. It's the worst thing that you can do when it comes to language learning. People say, how can I remember things? First of all, you have to focus. If you can't focus, you're gonna just, it's just a filter that cuts half or even three quarters of the information. Have a clear plan for which activities you will complete for the day. I don't know about you, but I know when I sit down, I know exactly what I want to do. Because I, I think about it beforehand. So, rule number two, and this is a really important one, is make it easy to start. Now, I thought, okay, well, you know, in order to learn a language, you have to learn it every day. But this is more difficult to do. It's easier said than done, as they say. So, I, I've been thinking about this, and I thought, okay, how can I make sure that I learn every single day? It doesn't have to be every single day of the year, because, you know, sometimes. Life gets in the way. Today, for example, it might be the first day after the, at the beginning of the year. I've been doing Greek every, every single day for at least an hour a day. Today, I might not do it because, you know, because of the Polyga conference. That's okay. But in general, I try to keep a streak of like a constant streak because that's where the magic happens. The compound effect starts uh, working. And this is called anchoring. Again, this is a concept that habit gurus have developed. It's, it's called anchoring or it has other terms, technical terms. But the concept is pretty simple and it works really well. And it works this way. If you want to make, if you want to make sure that you do something every day, attach it to other habits that you have so that you don't have to think about it and you make it automatic. Because if you have to uh, make a conscious effort of actually um, you know, thinking, oh, now I have to sit down and learn languages. If this comes out automatically to you, then it, it becomes much easier. So what I do is I wake up, I make my bed. That's the first thing I do. It's important for me. It gives me discipline. I write a journal for 20 minutes about my life. I meditate, I exercise, and then I learn languages. As, as soon as I finished exercising, I know I'm going to learn languages for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, and then it's done. Then I can move on to the rest of the day. And this has been working really well for me. On top of that, to compound this, I keep track of my learning. I keep track of my learning. Some, some people might find this a little bit heavy because after you learn, then you have to write what you've done, but you can keep it simple. So basically, I use a digital journal, and what I do is I write what I actually do. For, for example here, you can see 
I write the date, 27th of September 2020, Rome, the number of the session, what I've done, and possibly even comments. I've been, I, I found these comments to be um, very helpful because they help me think about the things I'm doing. Sometimes your taste changes, and you have to take that into account if you want to adapt to your skills changing and keep learning and keep it interesting. If it's, this is too complicated, some people might find it heavy to write all this after the learning session. You can just, I don't know if you ever heard of the Jerry uh, Seinfeld's Don't Break the Chain. You just grab um, a nice wall calendar and you just tick. Oh, I've done, you know, I've done my, my Greek session, I've done my Georgian session, my Russian session. So you can actually see it. It's like in the face. And this is a simple... So let's review and then we have the questions. I know, running out of time. Um, <clears throat> So the intermediate plateau is something that you cannot avoid. It's just going to happen because of the way our brain is structured. We tend to st our skills tend to stall unless we do something about it. And to overcome the plateau, it's important to address it from three different points of view. It's important to prepare your mind, learn how to learn, and organize your learning activities. In particular, to prepare your mind, it's important to be aware. It's really important to be aware of what happens, like the law of diminishing returns and the corresponding motivation dip but it's also important to connect emotionally or reconnect uh, emotionally and to keep it in front of you because the why is more important than any how. The second, the second uh, point is to learn how to learn. So uh, again, we haven't talked about specific, uh, specific techniques here, but it's important to make sure that you abide by these three principles. Consume compelling, comprehensible, and rich content. As it has, the, the content has to have these three components. Engage in purposeful practice together with simple practice if you want to keep improving and stay within the Goldilocks zone so that it's rewarding and you keep doing it. Because if it's rewarding, your brain will want to do it again the following day. To organize your learning activities, so that, that third, the third part is to design your environment, make it easy to start, and keep track of your learning if you want to in a, in a simple way because it's motivating. You're keeping track of your learning. You, you look back and say, oh, I've covered a lot of ground. So um, the last thing I wanted to say is that, again, I'm, in general, very passionate about language learning, but most of all education. And for those who are here and those who listened to this uh, talk through the internet, it's important to know, especially for those who never learned a language, it's important to, when things get tough, like when you're climbing a mountain, think about the next step, right? Th th focus on systems instead of goals, instead of thinking, I will get there and to obsess about it. Because language learning, and this might sound trivial, it's we are wired to learn any language. We've learned our own native language. We can learn every language. If you still don't believe it, just design systems that will help you take things one step at a time, because this is a very important point. And make sure you never, ever forget why you're learning a language. Thank you. Just one more. Just, just a second. I forgot the last slide, but anyway, uh, if you can put it on. Well, this was just, uh, you know, just in case, um, you know, the website, YouTube, Instagram, email, uh, I just wanted to say, just in case you want to ask me a question, I've been working, for example, specifically on a course which addresses these problems, and just if you want to know more about, about this, let me know, just you can send me a message through whatever here. Yes, thank you again, Luca. Uh, Luca um, we now go to the questions. Again, to ask the question, go on Slido and do the hashtag Babel. And we already see the questions. Just to let you know, I will close the option to ask new questions at 9.43 so that we can have again, uh, get over to the next talks. So uh, yes, please start answering the questions. You can just look at the screen. And um, I will have the subsequent. So I mark even the first okay. question. Okay, let's address one by one. How is it possible to have an extensive morning routine if you don't have flexible working hours? Uh, well, then it, it depends on a number of things. If you're, I don't know who asked this question, but if you are not, you can move it. So there's a, there's a couple of solutions. You can, for example, uh, make sure that you wake up a little bit earlier so you create some space, or you can make, for example, a 10-minute block. You don't have to learn for an hour. You can learn for 10 minutes, and then you can move uh, your language learning session uh, later. If you're working from 9 till 5, for example, you have to take into account also the energy. You have to ask yourself, what is my energy flow? I always have the same energy flow. I'm very, my energy is very high in the morning, then it crashes around 2. So if you see me sleeping there at 2, you know why? Just cla clash, literally crashes between 2 and 4. So knowing this, I have indeed a, fle a more flexible uh, working schedule, so I decide how to structure it. 
But I would say, if you have the, the chance, depending you know, uh, on, on your schedule, you can make it into three different uh, learning sessions during the day. And whoever asked this question can ask me later. I, I don't know the person. Normally, I take into account everything. It's, a complex, it's actually a complex question uh, because it depends on, on the person. But I normally would say, look at where your energy is at the highest peak, and then think about breaking down things so that you can learn maybe 10 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at lunchtime, and maybe 10 minutes in the evening, depending on your energy distribution. I'm watching Korean dramas with two subtitles. I keep re rewinding until I grasp it. Is this effective, or is it better to watch until the end and then repeat? It's a very interesting question. Um, I would say whatever floats your boat, as they say. So um, the most important thing is that you enjoy doing this. My question is, do you enjoy more watching Korean dramas with two subtitles and rewinding it, or do you like watching it just in one shot and then you know, um, do it step by step? My suggestion would be to um, install, if you have it, Language Reactor, this app. Then what you can do is to download the entire script, bilingual script, because it's free, it's fast, and then you just, with one click, you have the PDF with both languages. You read the script, you can analyze the script before you watch the drama, and then you watch the drama and you're gonna enjoy the drama. So you first do the kind of purposeful practice thing, and then you do the simple practice thing. You break it down into two different steps. That's what I would do, and that's actually what I do. How not to spend too much time looking for effective content? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think that uh, it's a big investment, and I think the most important thing that you actually wanna do is to spend time, maybe not considerable amount of time, looking for uh, effective content, because once you've done that, then you can dedicate your time to learning. So what I normally do is every month or every two months, I spend um, a couple of hours looking for content that is good at my level, so that then I have it and I just can work on it. Um, I, I think it's, it's worth the time. Maybe f five or ten hours is a little bit too much, but I think nowadays if you write, for example, best resources for intermediate learners, if you're if you use the imagination that Einstein was talking about, you can find everything on the internet in, in little time, in short time. Then you have to think, you have to have some criteria to abide by in order to assess whether, to gauge whether actually those resources are good for you. But in general, I think that you should invest time into looking for resources that are good at your specific level. What do you focus on when visiting the country where the language you're learning is spoken? I focus on input. I get as much input as possible so that I can go there and I can use the language. Mind you, sometimes you have this, these tourist books that you can you know, learn sentences like, um, how much is the bread? Or how can I do this? How can I do that? I don't do that. You can if you want to. But I just try to get um, as much language in me as possible. Normally, if I either travel to the country or I go living in country, I make sure that I get at least a B1 level, to a B1 level, because if you go there as a beginner, it might backfire. Actually, if you go there as a beginner, you think, I'm gonna learn the language. Like, it's just the language is gonna flow into my head. It doesn't work this way. You should get at least to an intermediate level, a low intermediate level, then you can reap the benefits of having a base that you can leverage in order to, to improve. So my simple answer is that get as much input as possible, listen to the language, because if you listen to the language, you understand it, then you're gonna feel more comfortable using uh, the language. And another thing I wanted to say is that, for example, no matter what, it depends on the person. Um, I'm not a particularly introverted, but I don't like using a language when I still don't speak it well in shops. I, know, I don't know if Richard is here, for example, I spent time with Richard the first time in Poland. Richard thrives in having all sorts of conversations everywhere. I don't particularly like that. So even after years, even under, uh, after understanding the language well, sometimes I use English and that's totally fine as a defense mechanism. Sometimes I don't want to feel like awkward, you know? So it's totally fine. But the bottom line is that if you understand the language well, you're going to feel much more comfortable in any situation. That's the first thing. Understand the language well before you engage in any conversation. Because every single experience that you have never lived before in another language will be a little bit awkward because it's getting out of your comfort zone. And getting out of your comfort zone, you know, always entails a little bit of gro growth in general, always entails a little bit of discomfort. So keep that in mind. It's going to happen psychologically that you're going to feel awkward no matter what at the beginning. Do you vary your method in any way depending on the, oh, do you vary your method in any way depending on the language? 
do your percentages differ based on how similar your new target is to languages you already know? This is a very interesting um, question. We talked about it yesterday with some friends, Lucas and company. There. Um, I would say that the strategy is fundamentally the same. So in terms of strategies and tactics, as the ancient Greeks talked about it, right? So strategies, the overall strategy is always the same, but the tactics are slightly different. For example, for Japanese, I made the enormous mistake of trying to learn it as you would learn any other European language, thinking, oh, that's easy. You know, I've learned French, I've learned Spanish, I've learned Russian, and uh, you know, these languages, the things that they have in common is a subject, verb, object kind of structure, right? But Japanese is a different beast because you have to think backwards. And I made the mistake of not taking that into account. So by using what I normally use, which is my bidirectional translation, that actually backfired. And that's why I found it difficult to actually learn Japanese. I dropped it for a little bit. I will take it back, but with it, tackling it from another perspective. So I would say generally, the strategy does not change, but the tactics, so the, the spe some specific methods, so some things that I do depend on the language, especially if a language has a different syntactical order. Syntax is my nemesis. If a language has a different syntax, I've been hearing from Lucas that Turkish is a nightmare in that regard because it has cases and different syntactical order, then I will be very cautious about how to tackle it because if you tackle it the wrong way, it can just backfire, especially at the beginning. What activity do you recommend the most to move from intermediate to advanced? This is opening a can of worms. I can talk about this for three hours. So we don't, unfortunately, we don't have time to address this. But what I would simply say is that the activities that I normally recommend are um, reading books, a reading in intensive mode by using, I use Google Lens. I will publish a video, re and it's also in, the, in, in my course. I have found a way, and since then, I'm super excited. I can uncode, decode every single, even Dostoevsky, I can read anything if I use Google Lens. And I can transform this into intensive and extensive reading. If you want to move to the advanced stages, you have to read and you have to read books because books contain the kind of language that is not within the everyday language that we use. This is really important. That's what I would recommend 100% is to read stuff that is, could be novels, could be nonfiction books, ex extensive and intensive reading, and then massive listening and watching, watching movies, listening to podcasts that are interesting, things you can understand. Listening and reading, this is the most important thing. If you want, then depending on what your aims are, then you can also engage in purposeful practice. What I do with my tutors is that and this takes a long time to explain, but I divide the, the speaking prepare the lesson beforehand. I consider just one specific topic, and then I find a way, for those who are interested, I can explain this later, I find a way to constantly get out of my comfort zone so that I can learn as fast as I can. And then in phase number three, I re-listen to the recording, and I try to integrate the feedback in order to keep improving on my skills. That's purposeful practice at its best. And for writing, you can write. If you want to also improve your writing, then you have to write. You have to write essays and you have to get feedback. If you don't get feedback, you're not going to improve that much. You need someone who gives you feedback. <clears throat> Sorry, this has been a little bit short, but it's, it's a very complex issue. But we don't we're lacking out. By the way, what, what time is it? Two more questions. Two more questions. <clears throat> ah. How do you maintain all your languages? What's your weekly maintenance schedule? Oh boy. So um, I, 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 keep a, I keep a journal. I, this is called my maintenance language journal. So I've been, keeping this, I've been keeping this journal for over the last two years to figure out how I actually maintain languages so I can take a look back and see, okay, how is it that I actually maintain languages? The first rule is to make languages part of your life. If you don't do that, it's really difficult to maintain languages. Ma languages are living things that you have to use. If you don't find a way to use them, it's going to be extremely, exceedingly difficult to, to maintain them. It's going to be very, very tough. So just to give an example, English, I use it all the time. English is a language that I, I read, write. It has become actually the primary language because I use it much more than my native Italian. Italian, I speak it because I live in Rome, so I speak it with my friends when I go out. But actually, it's, fun. it's funny, but in my... You know, in where I live, in my household, I, ho I use English um, a lot. French, I use it all the time. French is a language that has been part of my life since I moved to France and, and, and got to know Sophie Marceau. I got to know, I saw Sophie Marceau. 
Um, so I've been using it because I have a lot of friends. Uh, also in, in, in Rome, I used to live with French people. Uh, German, I use it a little bit less than the others, but I also use it quite a lot because I, I got into the habit of, uh, for example, reading Der Spiegel on a, on a daily basis. I divided my apartment into areas where each area and each activity is connected with a, with a, with a language. <laughs> so I know this sounds a little bit crazy, but that's how it works. For example, I don't know, in the bathroom I read, I don't know, Russian. In, uh, in, uh, when, when I wake up, I do Greek. So. Um, in, in the kitchen, I listen to French or Polish. You know, TVN, or, uh, for example, other, uh, other news. So, basically, on a daily basis, I use between six. On a good day, it's ten languages. On a poor day, it's five or six. I use them for purposeful, meaningful practice. So, sometimes it has become so second nature that I don't even think about it. You know, some languages has become just part of my life. That's how I maintain languages. And on top of that, I divide languages into two systems. System one is the languages that where I got to a level where I can use them for my life. System two is a language where I still have to actively learn them in order to reach a level where I can maintain them. There's maintenance mode and there's learning mode. So in this case, it's like, I've, I'm finished. Hungarian, I'm, 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 Hungarian, Greek, and Serbian are the languages that I'm actively learning where I have to sit down and learn every day. But the other seven or ten, I use them on a daily basis, and there are three or four I very rarely use, like Swedish, Dutch, Japanese, and Chinese. Now they've been in the back burner because unfortunately I can't deal with 15 languages every day. Otherwise I would go crazy, you know? I, I have a life apart from languages. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay. There's another one or a... We don't have time, okay? Okay, so thank you. Uh, so. I can take a picture of the, the answers, I can answer some later. Yeah, I mean, you're still here for some?